we all know road crashes is the leading cause of death and injury. Okay? So around the world, about 1.2 million people are killed every year. So about one people, person will die on the road every 2.7 seconds. Okay, in Australia alone, okay, about more than 1,600 road users are killed a year, okay, resulting in an economic cost of between 16 to $25 billion a year. Okay. Okay. So, in terms of research on road safety, we mainly focus on the three main components of the road system, the road and the environment in which we drive in, the people who use the road, and the vehicle on the road. Okay. And these three main players actually will determine the safety of the road system. Okay. But above that, you have the entire social economic environment in which the road system operate in. Okay. And to add to that, we have exposure. Okay. Exposure is a very uh, important confounding factor. It both determines the level of safety and also how we measure it. In terms of solution, okay, we have the traditional 3E, engineering, enforcement, education. Okay. And now we are adding on emergency response, evaluation, and economics to the mix. Okay. And of course, the safety of the system always depends on the leadership and management because of resource constraint. Okay. It's the top people who allocate the resources. So is driving a right or a privilege? Okay. I found this little paragraph in a Tasmania government. Okay. It says, having a driving license is a privilege. Okay. All drivers are expected to drive safely if you have a driving license. Okay. All road users have the right to be safe. So the right to be safe is stronger than the right to hold a license. So they classified the right to hold a license as a privilege. Okay. And anyone who have the privilege to own a driving license must obey the law. Okay. So a right are simply entitlement to do or not to do something, or to be or not to be in certain state. Okay. And when we define a right, we usually need to define who has the right. So in this case, drivers. Okay. <clears throat> And what rights? Okay, here is the right to drive that we are interested in today. Okay. And why do we have this right to drive? Okay. Is it a moral right or ethical right? Or is it some legal right given by the society? Or is it just customarily right? Because that's the way things have been done for donkey years. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And how that right can be affected by the action of the person, okay? So if the, the right can be forfeited or revoked, so means your right to hold a license, the government can take it away depending on your action. Okay. So there are clearly different levels of right and different types of rights. Okay. So you can see the right of privilege can go from one extreme, okay, something that you are born with and cannot be denied, like the right to life. Once you're issued a license, you have a right to drive, but that right can be taken away from you if you don't follow certain conditions laid out by the government. Okay. Okay. So the right to drive is granted by a legal authority okay. in most places, okay. and it can be revoked. Okay. So we have a right to apply for a license. That's a bit stronger than the right to drive. Okay, you have a right to operate a vehicle if you hold a valid license. Until the license is taken away from you, you can get into your car and you can drive. No one can stop you. Okay. Okay. So whether it's a right or privilege, it depends on how difficult it is for, to prevent people from doing something. Okay, and you can see, even you talk about driving, okay, there's very different stages of it. Okay. Then it get me thinking a bit. Okay. The right to well-being of physical, whether it's physical health or mental health, and the right to liberty and freedom. 
is, in most developed countries, is a basic human right. Okay, so it's a very strong right. So if the right to being, well-being is a basic human right, okay, and travel is vital to our well-being, okay, then do we have a basic right to travel that the government should not take away? The next question comes, if driving is essential to travel, do we have the right to drive? That decision is divided. Okay. So, travel is now considered a basic human right, but driving is a customary right. So it depends, that means it goes to, you must go to follow the local tradition, local rules, and the government can impose conditions on the right to drive. So note that the travel and driving is only a significant contributor okay, and not a necessary condition for your well-being and your liberty. Okay. That means if we have this, we can drive. It's, it will improve our freedom and our well-being. Okay. But if we don't have the right to drive, it doesn't mean that you will die or you'll be confined. Okay. So that's why it's not a basic human right. It's sort of in between and the government can impose condition on you. <coughs> okay. And a lot of it has to do with local customary right because different places, okay. the need to drive changes. If you are in a city that's well provided alternative transportation, the need to drive is a lot lower than if you are in a rural area, there's no way other modes of transport, then the need to drive is a lot stronger. So we know there's a strong need for people to travel okay, for the quality of life. Okay. And travel also increases economic output and produces social benefit. Okay. It's still the dominant travel mode in Australia. Okay. And that's why it's, it's much stronger right than a lot of other countries. Okay. So from an economic standpoint, okay, driving should not be restricted without good reason because there's a strong benefit associated with driving. Okay. So in order for the government to come, up, come forward and say, okay, you should not drive, you must have a very strong reason. Okay. Okay. So what constitutes reasonable restriction? As an economist, okay, we allow government to come in and interfere with our freedom only when the market fails. Okay, that means there's externality involved in this case, negative cost. And in terms of driving, the negative cost that we normally cite is road traffic accident. Okay. So when we drive and drive with high risk, there's a high likelihood of us getting involved in a road traffic accident which imposes a cost on society. Okay. The next condition, okay, it's a lot harder and not often proven in most real restriction, real life cases. Okay. Uh, economies would also require that the marginal benefit of the restriction is higher than the marginal cost. So if you're going to restrict, impose restriction, what's the benefit and what's the cost? And a lot of time, those are not calculated. Okay, we think it's a good idea, we do it, okay, regardless of the benefit or the cost. Okay. So the most common restriction that government impose are on two groups of people, or road users, the young novice drivers and then the aging drivers because of this graph that uh, has been shown by many people. Okay. Your fatality rate per distance traveled is a lot higher for the younger and older drivers. Okay. So we have graduated licensing system in most developed countries today. Okay. So in that system, we introduce the driver slowly to risk. Okay. So in Australia, we have the L 
you know, start with the L, then to the P1, P2, before you get your full license. Okay. So to get a learner permit, you need to be at least 16 years old, pass a theory test, and pass a vision test. Okay. So there's quite a bit of research on minimum age requirement. Okay. So in Australia, we are sort of in the middle. We start with 16. Okay. In North America, it's 13 years old. You can start to get a learner's permit. In a lot of Asian countries, you have to be 18 and above. Okay. So there's some research on the minimum age, and it seems that later you let people start learning to drive, the safer it is. Okay. Passing a theory test, okay, a lot of research has been done on that theory and vision test doesn't seem to have any impact on road safety. <laughs> okay. But it has got high face validity. It's intuitive and so everybody keep it and there's no reason to take it away, so we keep doing it. So from an economic standpoint, this doesn't pass the test and shouldn't be there. Okay. Learning to drive on an L plate, okay, you need to have a qualified instructor that's clear because you're learning how to drive. No mobile phone, zero BAC, max five demerit points. So mobile phone and BAC, this, there's a lot of research on this that says driving with mobile phone and driving with uh, blood alcohol, with alcohol in your blood is uh, in greatly increased the risk. Okay. So these are reasonable restrictions. Okay. To get a P1 license, you need to be at least 18, pass the hazard perception test, and pass the on-road test. Okay. There, has, there is a, quite a lot of research on hazard perception tests that say it does improve safety, okay, reduce your likelihood of a crash. Okay. The on-road test, not so good. Okay. <laughs> but again, it's customary. We have been doing it for many years, and we continue to do it. Okay. <coughs> On a P1 license, again, no mobile phone, okay. zero blood alcohol, no high performance car. Okay. Then again, minimum, maximum of five demerit points and minimum of one year you have to stay on a P1. Okay. That one year is sort of determined by the fall in the crash risk. Okay. It's also for convenience. Okay. You can actually move it up or down a couple of months, it doesn't really make that much difference. Okay. To get a P2 license, you need to have 12 months of good driving record. Okay. Again, no mobile phone, no high performance car, no alcohol. Okay. This seems to be the common restriction. Okay. And then to get a full license, you need to wait for three years and have a clean driving record. Okay. So, <clears throat> There's a lot of studies on the graduated licensing system, okay, and there's a Cochrane review that re sort of summarizes a lot of these results and find that uh, graduated licensing system do reduce crashes among novice drivers. Okay. Between four to 60 percent. Okay, so how effective it is depends on how it's implemented and where it's implemented. Okay. But we don't know which part of the system or restriction is more effective than the other. Okay. And that's something we need to uh, in, invest more effort on. Okay. Okay. And we also need to know what part is necessary, what part is not necessary, and how strict we need to be. Again, from an economy standpoint, just because something works doesn't mean that it should be implemented. You need to look at the cost versus benefit. Second thing you need to look at, if you increase it slightly stricter, slightly less strict, what's the difference? And we haven't answered or are even asked that question yet. Okay. Is five point too low, too high V, five demerit point? Should it be three points? Should it be eight points? Nobody has asked that question or answered it. Okay. So the when, once you have a full license, okay, most of the time your license will be taken away if 
you have accumulated too many demerit points. Okay, 12 points in three years. Okay. And then the demerit points we give. Okay, we consider drinking and driving the most serious. That's 10 points. And then speeding, eight and six points. Okay. Driving while well, tired, three points, and then some of, and no seat belt. This seems to be, Australia seems to be uh, very, very focused on drinking, driving, speeding, no seat belt, and fatigue. Okay, we spend a lot of time trying to blame the drivers for bad behavior instead of fixing our roads. <laughs> As an engineer, when I teach that, I always say that. Okay. If you look at the number of people killed on the road, 60% are people running off the road. If the road is designed properly, people should not run off the road, hit a tree, and kill themselves. Okay, so you cannot keep blaming, just blaming the drivers. Miss, our road design is not especially very forgiving to errant drivers. Okay. Okay. On the other end of the Driving spectrum is aging drivers. Okay. Licensing basically controls the number of drivers on the road. It doesn't control your age. So it doesn't change your age and your ability. So using the graph that people show with different age and different ability and crash risk is not the right information to use. So if you change the number of aging drivers on the road, does it actually have any impact on crashes on the road? So I plotted the number of license issued versus crashes, and that don't, doesn't seem to have any impact. So if you remove or increase the number of drivers on the road, it doesn't really have any impact on safety. Okay. So for 70s and above, okay. and this is for Alberta, <coughs> yes, you get the same result. Okay. There is, however, a positive relationship between number of aging drivers on the road and number of injury crashes. Okay, so aging drivers don't usually contribute to fatal crashes. They, but when they crash because of the physical and health condition, they tend to get injured. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot of research on performance of older drivers and then some common tests that we use. Okay. Overall, the Results are not very encouraging for the test. Okay, this test doesn't perform very well. Okay. Okay. We, a lot of these tests found positive correlation between crash risk and the test score, okay, but the correlations are very low. Okay. When I look at it, a lot of these tests are very time consuming. Okay, so some of these tests take like an hour to, to do, okay, and you need to have special setup. And so they cannot be actually implemented in a licensing center. You cannot go to the Department of, to, of Motor Vehicle to renew your license and then take a test. Okay. Okay. And so my recommendation was that they should not be made compulsory. Okay. Another set of evidence that I presented was some studies also from uh, Australia here. Okay. So Muak did some studies, two or three, I think four by now, yes, that compare Victoria with other states in Australia. And Victoria has the least restrictive licensing system for aging drivers. Okay. But if you compare Victoria normalized to one, yes, Against other states, Victoria seems to perform better. That means there's very little evidence to say stricter licensing rule actually improves safety. Well, again, that's simply because although we, we have found correlations between this performance in tests and crash risk, they are very low. The correlation is between 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 means it explains less than 10% of the variability in crash. Okay. Okay. And so among the 65 to 85 years old, driving ability vary considerably. Okay. 
So age-based policy are not likely to be effective. And that's the main recommendation provided to the minister. Okay. Simply driving ability and driving behavior are not the same. Okay. And drive, it's driving behavior that determines safety, not ability. Okay. Okay. So there, again, there are many simple engineering enhancements that can, can improve safety. And so we did a large-scale study on how to redesign the road so that it makes it safer for aging drivers. Okay. And the most important thing is that if we, need, if we want to test, we need better tests. The current tests we have are not very good. Okay. Okay. So uh, I did a follow-up project for the Alberta Motor Association on trying to look at the current set of tests we have and is there any way we can combine the results from different tests and predict whether a person is going to crash or not. Okay. And so we did a modeling exercises. We've, we got a, a sample of aging drivers to take all those tests and then tell us whether they have a crash in the last two years or not. And then we see their test score and see if we can in, in some way use this test score in some combination to predict whether the person has a crash or not. And we found that we can predict to almost 100% accuracy whether this person is going to crash or not. Okay. So again, to summarize, driving is a significant factor. It's very important to our health and well-being. Okay. It's also a major contributor to the economy. Okay. And so our right or our privilege to drive should not be removed unnecessarily. Okay. Driving should not be restricted unless it can substantially improve road safety. So it must be effective. Whatever policy program you put in place first must be effective. Second, the benefit must exceed the cost. And we, so far, very few programs we have done the cost-benefit analysis. Okay. If you restrict somebody's driving, how much does that cost him and the society for this person not being able to drive? Okay. And that's not just effectiveness, it's also on efficiency. Okay. And lastly, we need more research to find a better way of testing people if we're going to test. Okay. 